So questions on anything on this first page, independent, dependent, increasing the graph using concavity, increasing, decreasing, that kind of stuff. And then anything that said calculator active, that's where you can assume that would be on the calculator portion. Yeah. So it says on what interval is the con, oh, is it concave up? So this, because it changes direction right there, like that's where that point of inflection is. This goes like that. That's a really bad line, but, and that goes like that. Like, how do you know, do you know how you know, to I mean, if you look in the, the, I mean, the accurate way to do it is to literally find the slope of the lines as you go here. Okay. But you don't want to have to do that. It should, you want to be able to spot it. So I would just say, look for that point in which one curve is ending and the other one this if you keep going on this line to there the right side of that graph is not proportional to the left side of this graph right that's not symmetric so that's the easy way to see it I guess whereas if I keep going here it's much more symmetric yeah right so if that happens just I hope it's not that tricky but if it happens, just try to look at it pretty closely. God bless you. Yeah. Yeah, so increasing, decreasing, concave up, concave down are all not or equal to. The only time you're getting an or equal to is if it said where is it greater than or equal to zero? Those have brackets, but for everything else, they don't. Yeah. I I'm probably wouldn't take all the points, but I would take at least a point for that one. Any other questions on the first page? All right. Second page. Now we got into, again, this one, calculator active. You're finding the rate of change and the given interval. Um, the calculator active one here, estimate the rate of change at an individual point. And then the rest of this was not right. Yeah, no. Then we got to, is it a positive or negative rate of change, average rate of change, given interval, but those you can just plug in. And then the rate of change, um, over the consecutive length So this one, if it's, this is where you save some time, right? So the rate of change, let's just say I asked for the rate of change of number 10, you would tell me it's what? five but the rate of change of the average rate of change on a linear function is zero like that's a good way to save yourself some time okay if you're unsure go back figure out your rate of change figure out the difference in your rate of change but th those are questions in which it would be easier to save yourself some time when you do the the on consecutive inter intervals for a quadratic however this is where you've got to plug in your points and we plugged in four points so that you can get the rate of change of the rate of change if you don't get four points you don't have enough at the end. So you want to do negative one, zero, one, and two, find the difference, and then find the difference of those differences. And that's when you get your rate of change of the average rate of change. Um, for that one, like, you said it equal to four different points. You plug in, so plug in negative, because it doesn't give you an interval, right? It just says over consecutive equal length intervals. So you could plug in anything as long as it's consecutive and equal intervals, we just pick negative one, zero, one, and two. Yeah. Um, will the rate of change of the average rate of change always be like the same number? When you get to the second level. Yeah, 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 yeah. That second level is your rate of change of your average rate of change. For quadratic, it will always be the same. Okay. Yep. If it was cubic, you'd have to go another level. But these questions, we did, this was linear and quadratic section, so we only did linear and quadratic on those. All right, page three, now we got into concave up and down from a tight table, leading coefficient and degree. Um, is, it, is there guaranteed extrema, global, min, and max? And then the graph where you're finding absolute relative mins and max. Um, for, the, for the guaranteed extrema, is the, is the For this one? Yeah. You're looking for, so technically you're looking for your graph to go up and come back down again, but I said I'm not trying to trick you. Look for your zeros. So you're not, we're not doing like what the, um, what's that called, the brackets? No, right? No, because again, it's an interval of where it would fall between. The only time is when, 
This is brackets because it says greater than or equal to zero or less than or equal to zero. That's the only time those are brackets. What numbers are? 23 and 24. Oh. Yeah. So this is where would, I'm sorry, for given the interval, find where it's positive or negative. And I feel like you don't have to plug in points if you understand your end behavior. Like if you understand your end behavior and your multiplicity, you shouldn't have to plug in points. It'll save you that time. Okay. If I look at 23, because this is squared and positive, I know that this points up. And then if I know my zeros are at three and five, one, two, three and five, I know it's got to come down and come back up again. So when I'm looking for where it's greater than or equal to three, I mean, greater than, or, sorry, it's less than or equal to zero this time, less than or equal to zero, it's in between those two points, which is three and five. And I don't even have to plug in points. You can to check, but you don't have to if you understand multiplicity and, and, and even, I mean, and, and behavior. For 24, it's a negative x to the third, which means my ends would point up. So once I find my zeros, negative three, zero, and eight, the left side points up, the right side points down. None of them have a multiplicity more than one, so it crosses through, it crosses through, it crosses through. Now I'm looking for where it's greater than or equal to zero, which, oops, which is in between, no, sorry, right? Yes, it's here and it's here. It's from negative infinity to negative three, and then it's from zero to eight. So they plugged in points, which you don't have to if you understand your multiplicity and your even root. I mean, and your end behavior, I keep saying even root. Yeah. 25 says the degree of a polynomial is seven with real roots. So first of all, if it's seven, that means the total amount of roots has to be seven. It has a real root at negative eight, at positive one, at positive four, and X equals one has a multiplicity of three. So there are three of these. So there's three, there's one here, that's four, there's one here, that's five. So seven minus five leaves two non-real roots. That number has to be even. So if you mess it up and you would get like an odd number of non-real roots, you know you did something wrong because they have to come in pairs. Yeah. Would it ever be possible to, like, if you're given all the non-real things, you would equation to find yeah, you just work backwards. So you do x minus something, x plus something, and you multiply it all out. With yes, yeah, so you would still just have an i there. Yeah, they'd have to tell you what they are. Like, let's say it said you have an x, which we're going to get to eventually, not for your test, but four negative three, and then the non-real roots two i. I know that that means it's x minus four, x plus three, x minus two i, and that means there's also a negative two i. So it'd be x plus two i, and then you'd literally foil it out. That's what advance is doing now, actually. We'll go back to it. Yeah. Not on your test. Yet. All right. Uh, degree from your graph, um, even and odd from, I mean, sorry, degree from a chart, even and odd from a graph. Any questions on those? So I think the easiest way is to know your end behavior, right? So like your end behavior, because look for the highest one. The highest one is even, which means they both go up or both go down. It's positive, so they both go up, right? Then you find your zeros. So I factor this, and you get x minus 3 and x minus 5, which means you have zeros at 3 and 5. So I plot my 1, 2, 3, 0, and 1, 0. And neither of those has an even multiplicity, which means it crosses through both of them. So if the end behavior both goes up, and it has to cross through it, it's going to look something like that. I don't know how far down it goes, but I know it goes below the x-axis there. So then when it says, tell me where the graph is less than or equal to zero, I'm looking for the range in which it's underneath the axis or at the axis, which would be from the x here to the x here that they're asking for the x values. So they get bracket, brackets. And what if it said uh, if it said greater than, then it'd be up here and up here. So it'd be from negative infinity to 3 and then 5 to positive infinity. If it said f of x or whatever is greater than or equal to 0. You're welcome. And then the last page, even and odd from your equation, the end behavior using your limit notation. 
your graph using your limit. You remember this could be anything in here. We just needed something to go up on both sides. That's all. And then the extra test prep questions, multiple choice options for one five and one six. Alex. All right, so it says a polynomial function has three real zeros, four non-real zeros. One of the real zeros has a multiplicity of six. What's the degree of the polynomial? So if it has three zeros, you've got one X, another X, and another X, and you've got four non-real. And one of these has a multiplicity of six. So that means there's six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 total roots. So whatever that multiplicity is, you want to, you know, like assign it to one of those real roots or a non-real roots, but, and then just count from there. All right, this one said the polynomial function G is given by, and then they gave you the equation, which of the following describes the zeros of G. So first of all, what does distinct mean? Like distinct would be like a unique, so it doesn't have, it's not like you see two and two again. Okay, distinct means three different ones, right? So, or two different ones in this case. So it says the polynomial, whatever is given, this means this would be zero, so X would be six. This, I can't factor, right? There's no factors of two that sum to two. So if I wanted to figure out, really I just need to know are those real or non-real? Because it could be that they're real and I'd have to use the quadratic formula or that they're non-real using the quadratic formula. So negative B plus and minus the square root of B squared minus four times A times C over two times A. All I really need to know from this is what's the sign underneath that. It's also called the discriminant or yeah, which is B squared minus four AC. It's the same thing. So this is four minus eight. It's gonna give you a negative underneath which tells you that there are two non-real zeros. So when you look at this, it says it has two distinct real zeros. It has three distinct real zeros. It has one distinct real zero and no non-real. It has one distinct real zero and two non-real zeros. And that's the one that matches what we just found. So if this was squared, let's say, now there's a one, it's one answer with a multiplicity, like that might be an option in your list. So you gotta look for things like that, okay? But again, distinct just means different, yeah. It would only be to like find out what kind of answer it is, so you don't have to go all the way through. But yeah, at least to know what kind of roots those would be, yeah. No, it would never tell you there's, it could tell you there's two distinct non-real and that means that there's really four. You can't go from three to four. You wouldn't know which ones are doubled. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 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 So if it said something like there were two distinct non-real numbers, that really means there's four because each one of those has a, no, actually it won't say that. It would just be two. It won't say that because those could be like two I and negative two I. So it won't make you try to figure it out like that. Yeah. It might say one of your non-real zeros is 2i, and then you would have to know the other one is negative 2i. But there's too many possibilities in what you just said. It won't, that won't happen. It has to be enough information. Any other questions on the PDF review? Say what's the max, what's the min, or at the x equals, at x equals. <laughs> All right, your absolute min. Absolute min was that negative one, negative three, and absolute max did not exist because the arrows point up. Lena on top. Rate of change at the point. This is why you have your calculator, people. You have two minutes. Let's see how fast you can do it. I am so serious. All right, I'm, we're going to chalk this up to time for the most part, but let's talk about it, okay? 
If you need to find the rate of change at a single point, then I have to do F of 5.001 minus F of 5 over 5.001 minus 5. And in your calculator, you're plugging in what F of X is. So that becomes your Y equals, okay? Y equals 3 square root X plus 4. And then using that variable menu, right, you can plug in, you can do your fraction, you do it all in one step. If you're uncomfortable doing it that way, then you have to do 3 times the square root of 5.001 plus 4 minus 3 times the square root of 5 plus 4 over 5.001 minus 5. And then you should have gotten like pretty close to 0.5. It rounded to 0.5. All right, good, even, it's symmetric to the y-axis. Does the equation represent something that is even, odd, or neither? All right, so it, you plug in a negative x and it goes to an, an odd power, that is gonna, <laughs> that's gonna change. And then the odd in the, neg in the x to the third, it's going to change. But there is no exponent. I mean, there's no variable in the 11. It doesn't change. All right, end behavior. I know, it's tiny. There's no way to show that good. Red, red is negative, positive. Blue is positive, negative. Yellow is negative, negative. And green is positive, positive. All right, it is the highest exponent. Don't fall for this trick, right? The highest exponent is not the first one. So it's a positive coefficient, which means they're both pointing up. It is multiple choice on your test, but it says limit. Instead of where it says X arrow, it would say the limit as X approaches. Okay, that's just so you can mentally prepare yourself for that. Oh, Carolina's on top. All right, rate of change from the equation. Rate of change from an equation. If you're doing work right now, shame. Shame. <laughs> rate of change of a linear function is? How do you find the rate of change of a linear function? It's a slope. Rate of change of the average rate of change. <laughs> Next time you guys do this little fort. <laughs> God help the PSAT when it's online. <laughs> if you're still doing work, shame. <laughs> All right, pretty good. R rate of change of an average rate of change of a line would be zero. It's giving you the interval four to nine. The interval is four to nine. I'm gonna try to zoom in. Four to nine. You had to do three plugged in, right? So seven minus nine, negative two. Then one plugged in, which was four, negative two minus a negative four becomes negative six, and then the rate of change over two. <laughs>